Good afternoon. Last time I talked about the fact that the quality of shipbuilding in the Russian Empire was none. And this is one of the main reasons for Russia's defeat in the Russo-Japanese War. Moreover, the quality was lost even at the stage of working out of design assignments. Then something was not done very well in the projects themselves. Well, what was built in Russian shipyards is characterized by the words, this can float. But since this was made of steel, in Tsushima and in the Port Arthur area, a lot of ships sank. Now we will move on to the theme of the interconditionedness of constructions and technologies. That is, it is precisely the following link that contributes to the quality of products, the construction of the product and the technology of its production. Once again, the definition of quality of product. The quality of a product is an objective given and it is a combination of two factors. The first factor is a complex set of metrologically consistent characteristics of a product that are objectively inherent in it. And the second factor is a measure of correspondence of this very complex set of characteristics of the product and each of the characteristics with the tasks of satisfying the user's needs in those conditions of product operation and maintenance offered by life throughout the entire life cycle. There is one more default left here, which leads to the canon. Because if we correlate with each other, all these characteristics that are included in the complex set determining quality, that is, we get a proportion, then the canon is a certain proportion of these very characteristics that form a complex set that determines quality as the ability of a product to meet the tasks for which it is produced. Well, it was said that this table covers the entire life cycle of a product and if it is carefully filled in, in relation to a certain specific type of product, then you can fit into the canon. Moreover, you can fit into the canon at the pace of scientific technological progress, because in our time, the pace of development of the technosphere, science, do not allow the formation of canons by the method of trial and error, since many objects of the technosphere are becoming obsolete faster and are being replaced by functionally new ones faster than a canon, based on almost thoughtless use of trial and error, takes shape. Now let's look at one more picture. This is 1930, the United States. The car is called Duesenberg Model J, with an imperial cabriolet body. This is the end of the carriage style, when the car resembled a carriage in design. The carriage style in the body is evidenced by the absence of a trunk and a chest on the rear shelf above the bumper which served as a trunk, but was made of something constructionally separate from the rest of the body. At that time, Duesenberg represented one of the highest achievements of engineering thought in the field of the automotive industry. That is, it can be taken as one of the standards of quality. The company produced cars in small numbers, almost to custom orders. More or less mass production was only the chassis and the engine, and everything else was done by hand, and the quality in this case was ensured both by the high qualifications of the car design engineers and the high qualifications of those workers who practically made such cars by hand on an individual basis. The Duesenberg company collapsed. It collapsed despite the technical perfection of the cars it produced. As in many cases, it was ruined by a narrow specialization. It was oriented on a very narrow segment of the market. Cars for the upper elite, very expensive, but few in number. When certain problems arose in the market, then the cost price of the cars, in particular Cord, which was almost the first car with a front-wheel drive with retractable headlights, turned out to be high enough that the company could not provide itself with a regular profit, allowing it to function in the future. Ford did not have such problems, because Ford initially focused its production on an extremely wide segment of the market, cars for mass use, and luxury cars, the Lincoln brand, appeared in the Ford spectrum of products only in the 1930s, when the company was firmly on its feet and had successfully survived the blow of the Great Depression of 1929. Therefore, if we want to ensure the consumer well-being of the entire society, at least that part of it that wants to work and can work, then the approach that was implemented in Duesenberg 
cannot be implemented in this case for the simple reason that labor productivity with individual fulfillment of almost every order will be insufficient. There will not be enough production space and the performance speed of this system will leave much to be desired. Therefore, we can admire Duesenberg, admire the way the paved courtyard in which it's parked reflects its polished doors, testifying to the highest quality of car production, but we will have to limit ourselves to this, and the question will arise as to how to mass-produce high-quality products. But in order to mass-produce high-quality products, we will need, keeping in mind these abstractions about the definition of quality, about the table that covers the life cycle of the product, on the basis of the filling of which it is possible to form a canon. Keeping all this in mind, we will have to address another abstractionism. Look, here is the scheme. This is the basic scheme. On the horizontal axis, we have the measure of a certain measurable parameter, which is included in the complex set, on the basis of which the quality of product is determined and formed. If we look at this parameter, then it's clear that some values of this parameter will be acceptable for us, and some values of the same parameter will be unacceptable, because if the product has such characteristics for this parameter, then it will somehow not satisfy us precisely in the aspect of quality. Therefore, the minimum acceptable value appears, and the maximum acceptable value of the parameter appears. But this is the simplest case, because in more complex cases, this quality interval here, the tolerance field, it can be discontinuous. That is, there may be some prohibited intervals on it, there may be discretes, the acceptance of the value of which, for one or another reason, is intolerable. Well, for example, if we consider the oscillation frequencies of a device as a measurable parameter, then we can accept a certain frequency range from minimum to maximum as tolerable. But if some frequencies fall into this frequency range at which the product will experience resonance, then even if it falls into this range, these frequencies at which there will be resonance will be prohibited for us, because they will violate our understanding of the quality of the product. They can be prohibited in general, or they can be tolerable in some transitional modes, but intolerable in the main modes of operation of the product. Therefore, one must understand that quality is primarily characterized by the measurability of the parameter and the tolerance field, a certain interval between the minimum acceptable value and the maximum acceptable value. If in this interval you choose some more intervals, then you will get a certain sortedness. That which is close to the limits is the third sort. That which is in the center of the interval is the highest sort. Such is the approach. Now let's turn to some modification of this scheme. In general, everything is the same here, the tolerance field, but the density of the distribution of the manufactured products is imposed on the tolerance field. The area under the curve of distribution density is 100% of our production. And that is all that falls into the tolerance field. These are conditioned products. And everything that is not included in the tolerance field is defect. The defect in this scheme is shaded with a square shading. Now let's recall an anecdote. The anecdote says that a certain American company ordered some products from the Japanese. When the first shipment arrived, the Americans opened the box and found a letter there. The letter said, although we don't understand the customer's wish that the number of defects should not exceed 2%, nonetheless, meeting the customer's wishes, we produced 2% of defective products. All products are packed in the containers with a capacity of 100 units. And to distinguish defective products from conditioned products, the defective products are wrapped in red wrapping paper. This anecdote implies that all 100% of production, that is, the entire distribution density of production, is not the same as is shown in this scheme, but it has already become narrower. And all these areas, which are marked here as defect, they cease to exist because the entire density of distribution fits into this tolerance field. Well, now let's look at a complex product. A complex product includes several tens of thousands of various parts, which are somehow connected to each other, 
And accordingly, each connection is also a certain parameter that can also be characterized as contributing to the quality of the product. And accordingly, there also appear certain tolerance fields, some prohibitions. Well, further it turns out that if you want to produce high quality products, then accordingly, every one of these tens of thousands of parts must fit into its own set of tolerance fields. Every connection of these parts must also fit into its own set of tolerance fields. And in this case, you will receive a quality object, quality product at the production stage. Well, if at least one of the products is made incorrectly, then there may be trouble. When we started the theme of the philosophy of governance towards quality, I said that two AM-22 Ante planes crashed with all the crews and the cargo on board as a result of the fact that one worker, due to the weakness of his body, was not able to cut the flash off the roots of the propeller blades of the Ante engines with a plastic knife and cut it off with a steel boot knife. As a result, microcracks appeared. The microcracks during the operation of the engines got bigger, turned into macro cracks, and in the end, the propeller of the engine crushed in flight, and the scattered blades damaged the aircraft. In the first case, the plane was depressurized and burst like a balloon, which we pierced with a needle. And in the second case, the blade hit one of the engine control units, as a result of which, all four aircraft engines stopped, and the plane collapsed like a stone. So if we are talking about high-quality products, complex technical products where the number of parts and their connections may exceed not even tens, but hundreds of thousands, then the one case that falls beyond the tolerance field can result in disaster. Therefore, the question arises, what to do? Because if we turn again to the Deming principles, then Deming says that we must cease dependence on mass inspection. Because the inspection on a mass basis in relation to complex technology, this is a variant of bringing it to the point of absurdity. We have to disassemble this, as they say, down to the screw, make sure that all the screws, all the details are correct, and then reassemble. If we have any disposable things in the construction, then we must replace these disposable things with new ones. Well, besides this, if the construction includes some functionally necessary for its operation fluids, in this case, something is poured into the radiator and something is poured into the hydraulic drive, then, most likely, we must also replace the drained fluids. After we reassemble everything again, we are faced with the question, is it high quality or not? It is clear that it's impossible to carry out technical control of manufactured products at this level, Although in order to improve the system of governance towards quality, the organization of technologies, such technical control is necessary as a certain episode in the work of the quality service. When a certain number of parts are selected from a batch of finished products, it undergoes a total analysis, and after that, everything is discussed on the theme of how it was assembled, what is the quality of its own products, what quality of products is received from suppliers, and so on and so forth. Not to mention the fact that this kind of defect detection is useful to carry out on the basis of taking from service certain types of equipment in order to see how quality is lost during operation and what needs to be done to ensure that the quality is at a sufficient level throughout the entire life cycle of the product. Therefore, let's turn to the next scheme. In fact, this is also an abstraction. This is our production process in time. The production process in time is considered as a trajectory in the space of formal parameters with dimension n. Here the line shows an ideal trajectory of the flow of the production process. The ideal trajectory means that if you take raw materials, components, services of external suppliers, and all these components are of high quality, then, if you observe a technological discipline, then the production process will come to its end, which is indicated by the point product. And this point will be in the middle of the tolerance interval for each control parameter, with the help of which you characterize the quality of the product. Here it is important to pay attention to the fact that at the input, there must be quality raw materials, quality components, quality services of external suppliers. And in this case, 
If you have organized the production process right, that is, the right technologies are used there which allow you to obtain quality, the interconnection of these technologies with each other at different stages of the production process of the product is also organized with quality, then you will guaranteedly receive quality products. And in this case, you find yourself free from the need to control every product by one or another means of technical control. The production process itself, its organization and technological discipline, which the personnel must follow in the implementation of the production process, work for quality. What else do we have here? There is also this strip that lies on either side of the ideal trajectory of the flow of the production process. An ideal flow is like the movement of a steamer along the river. There are fairway boundaries beyond which the steamer is unable to go, because this will be a navigational incident. And here it's exactly the same. Any technological process in the composition of the production process can deviate from the ideal course. But these deviations should not be supercritical. And even if they occur, the product should still be within the tolerance range, according to all parameters that characterize the quality of this product. Here, in this scheme, we see that there are two types of tolerances. The first type is control tolerances. Control tolerances characterize the product, the result of the production process. And again, control tolerances characterize raw materials, components, services of external suppliers. That is, there is a certain incoming control of everything that we need for the needs of our own production. But the production process itself, at each of its stages, is characterized by technological tolerances. That is, they answer the question of how far the technology, or the production process as a whole, can deviate from the ideal so as not to violate the quality of the product. Moreover, I want to draw your attention to the fact that I've been using the terms technology and production process for some time. They are not the same thing, because technology is one of the pieces of the production process. For example, if you have a certain metal structure and you have to paint it, then painting technologies can be different. It can be powder painting, it can be paint from a spray gun, it can be paint from a spray gun in an electrostatic field, and it can be ordinary painting with a brush. All these are different technologies that may or may not be included in the production process. In some circumstances, one technology may be included in the production process. In some other circumstances, technologies in the production process may be interchangeable. That is, if for some reason you paint with powder, but there appears a problem with the supply of powder or with the maintenance of equipment for this painting, then you can paint the same product using a different technology. And most importantly, the result should be such that there are no complaints about the quality of the painting, both in the aspect of aesthetics and in the aspect of protecting the metal from corrosion for a certain period which must be guaranteed. But the production process is always a process that includes many technologies, and its building is always the selection of technologies, their interconnection, that is, the assembly of the production process from technologies. If the production process at an enterprise covered everything, starting from the extraction of raw materials and energy carriers, then our beginning would be somewhat different. We would not have a tolerance field, in fact, a plurality of tolerance fields for each of the required for the needs of our own production, product, raw materials, services. Our beginning of the whole process would be in the natural environment. But we live in conditions of social unification of labor, production specialization of enterprises, as a result of which the national economy appears before us as a set of sectors. And we, even having organized everything ideally at our enterprise, that is, the production process is built on the basis of the best technologies, the connection of technologies with each other is flawless, we find ourselves hostages to the quality of the raw materials, components supplied to us, and the services of external suppliers.
In the old days, it was fashionable to criticize Joseph Vissarionovich that we supplied Germany with iron ore, grain, and so on and so forth. But the devil is in the metals. We supplied the Reich with extremely non-enriched iron ore and referred to the fact that this was not spelled out in the supply contracts and we did not have enrichment technology. Due to this circumstance, the Reich, receiving iron ore from us, was forced to spend on its enrichment and on bringing it to a condition where it could be used in blast furnaces. This is an example of the fact that having organized everything ideally at our enterprise, we can be hostages of our suppliers, who either supply quality products for the needs of our production, or supply defective products, defective in different ways. Either it forces us to reduce the quality to a lower level, but still allows the production of products, or it turns out that the products supplied by the suppliers have a rather high proportion of defects. And if we don't filter this defect, then part of our products will be of high quality, part of our products will be of poor quality due to the fact that we use some defective raw materials, defective components, defective services, which our suppliers either could not get rid of or did not want to get rid of. In other words, the problem of replacing incoming control with some alternative really exists in all macroeconomic systems. And so we have just now come to that which fits into the systems of governance towards quality of product on the basis of the ISO 9000 series of standards. Since incoming control is very expensive, and it would greatly increase the cost of all products, making many enterprises uncompetitive, if not in the internal market, where incoming control is imposed on everyone, then in the external market, where some are freed from the need for incoming control, then the question arises of how to reduce costs. So the system of standards of the ISO 9000 series involves the certification of the system of governance towards quality of product. But certification must be understood correctly, because the purpose of certification is not to issue certificates, not to draw up documents on the basis of which the system of governance towards quality of product allegedly functions or factually functions at the enterprise. But the purpose of certification is to make sure that the production process, all technologies that are used in it, lie within the fields of technological tolerances for the deviation of these very technologies and the production process from a certain ideal trajectory in the flow of the production process in a certain space of formal parameters of dimension n, which has peculiarity for most enterprises. Therefore, there appear companies that prepare an enterprise for certification according to the ISO 9000 system. What do these companies do? These companies are engaged not only in the production of a package of documents stating that everything is done at the enterprise in accordance with the ISO 9000 standards, they help, above all, to build a metrologically consistent system of technological tolerances at all stages of the production process. And in the documents that they provide and help to draw up for the producer of this or that product, it is precisely the course of the production process within the framework of the limitations of the technological tolerances that is described. When the package of documents is formed and the organization of production is brought into correspondence with the allowing of one to control the production process throughout the set of technological tolerances at all its stages, then a certification company enters the market, which conducts an audit of the system of governance towards quality. During the audit, it is not so much the compliance of documents with standards that is checked, but the compliance of the actual production process with everything that is written in the governing documents for this enterprise on the quality control system based on the ISO 9000 standards. That is, again, the course of the production process in the stream of the entire plurality of fields of technological tolerances is checked. If this is not the case, then the certificate is not given. And accordingly, the ISO 9000 system and governance towards quality on the basis of it are functionally operable 
only if the companies that help enterprises prepare for certification according to the ISO 9000 are professionally consistent and factually prepare enterprises for this certification by analyzing technologies and the production process, helping to form a metrologically consistent system of tolerances for each technological process used in this enterprise. The companies that certify the system of governance towards quality of enterprises also work not so much on the formalism of documents, but on the analysis of whether it is possible, on the basis of the system of tolerances adopted at the enterprise, characterizing its production process, to obtain quality products. These two groups of companies are not at all parasites. They are necessary because they ensure the assembly of a macroeconomic system from a multitude of enterprises, each of which produces something different. Someone produces fasteners, someone produces electrodes. Someone, on the basis of fasteners and electrodes, produces some other products. If the fasteners and electrodes are of poor quality, then these products will also be of poor quality. Therefore, these two groups of companies that prepare an enterprise for certification and are engaged in certification, since they are authorized by the relevant state authorities to do this, they sell their honesty on the market. Because if a certificate is received, but in reality the system of governance towards quality does not work, then the consumer of the products of this enterprise, faced with the low quality of the products, casts doubt on the competence of those companies that prepared this enterprise for certification, which provided deliberately false certificates. Providing deliberately false certificates. This system works more or less successfully in conditions when the owners of the enterprise, top managers, due to general cultural factors, are forced to consider the enterprise as the main source of their income. And if the collapse of the enterprise leads to the fact that they are deprived of their social status, because if, let's say, they own a large industrial enterprise and manage to bring it to bankruptcy, then even if they can sell assets and liabilities, then they are unlikely to be able to transfer capital into some other sphere, because in fierce competition, all niches in the market are occupied and they are unlikely to move someone there. Therefore, most likely, they will only be able to spend away capital or join a financial casino in all sorts of speculative markets. If such a situation exists, then the system of governance towards quality on the basis of the ISO 9000 can really be quite efficient. Well, taking into account the vices of this system itself, inherent in it as a system, due to vicious system-forming principles. But these enterprises that prepare certification for production enterprises, those that carry out certification, give certificates. They must work professionally and honestly. If these factors are not present, then documents on the conformity of the ISO 9000 systems of standards will be faked. Certificates that, yes, the enterprise is certified to the ISO 9000, will be given, but there will be no quality of the product. This is the fundamental difference between what is happening in Russia and what is happening, for example, in the Federal Republic of Germany. In Russia, there are no factors that ensure the preparation of enterprises for certification, according to the ISO 9000, in terms of the formation of a system of technological tolerances that guarantee the production of high-quality products, and there are no conditions in which certifying companies would refuse to provide certificates if there are only documents on the readiness of the enterprise for certification. But, in fact, the organization of the production process, the systems of technological tolerances that are adopted there, do not allow to ensure a high-quality result. And this is a fundamental difference between what is in Russia and what's in the Federal Republic of Germany and other developed, in terms of science and technology, states of Europe, the United States and Australia. The system works there precisely on account of the fact that the company that prepares the enterprise for certification and the companies that are authorized to give certificates of compliance of enterprises with the ISO 9000 system, if they act dishonestly, they quickly leave the market of these services. Well, 
As for our governorially illiterate deputies, the board of directors of the central bank, they did everything in order that the production sector would be destroyed, and in order that the cost of building systems of governance towards quality of product would be so high, if you are factually engaged in it, that no enterprise in the financial climate created by the deputies and the central bank could withstand this. In modern conditions, after the quality of the product is programmed at the level of the set of requirements for it, and a construction that implements a set of requirements, everything that follows is determined by technological discipline. What technological discipline is, for the majority, is an abstraction. The simplest example comes from cooking. There is a mackerel fish, and let's say you want to eat fried mackerel. What do you need to do? First of all, of course, you need to buy this mackerel. In our country, mackerel is sold frozen. The frozen mackerel should be in a refrigerator or in a freezer, but it should not thaw, because when it thaws, it will turn into something flabby, from which it will be impossible to make something tasty. After that, you have to make a salad from greens and so on, and put it on a plate. On the plate, you should also put a lemon, cut into quarters, so that later you could use this lemon to sprinkle on both the greens and the fish. After that comes the most important thing. You take out a frying pan, pour oil in it, put it on the flame, and the frying pan heats over the flame. In the meantime, while it heats up, you cut off the head of the mackerel, gut it, rip out the skeleton, remove the black things from the abdominal cavity, and you have two parts of fillets. They haven't thawed yet. In this form, you salt and pepper them to taste. Your frying pan is hot, and you put one part of the fish in it. Then, two minutes on one side, and a minute and a half on the other side, with a spatula, it goes from the frying pan onto the plate, and, yum yum, it is delicious. If you keep the mackerel in the pan for even one extra minute, that's it, it will become dry like a sole. And you will need to switch to another culinary technology, add water to the pan, add spices to the water. In the end, based on this broth, you will get one or another sauce, and mackerel stewed in this sauce. But this process will take you at least 40 minutes. Therefore, adherence to the technological discipline, as I described, allows you to get juicy, fried, tasty fish. If you violate the technological process, especially in the aspect of frying, that is, on one side at the beginning, for example, you also fried one minute and a half, but not two, then your fish will not be properly fried. The difference in two minutes, but not a minute and a half, is needed so that you put the fish that has not been thawed in the pan, and it thaws intensively due to the heat of the pan. Then, when it thaws, you fry less on the other side. This is a simple example, accessible and understandable to everyone. A more complex example of a technological discipline is not accessible, is not felt by the majority of our young people, although it may be remembered by those who grew up in the era of film photography. I will not talk about the artistic merits of certain images, but I will talk about the technological process of obtaining a high-quality photo. 35mm film in the USSR was sold in rolls with 36 frames each. Cameras were made for this film standard. First, you had to buy a film. After that, in the dark, unpack the roll and rewind the film from the roll onto the film reel, without splashing the film with your own fingerprints on one side or the other. After that, the film reel was inserted, it was closed, and in this form the film was put into the camera. Moreover, there were cameras, for example, the Kiev, which had very peculiar film reels. After the film reel has been put into the camera, the camera locks. Locking the camera opened the film, and this eliminated the friction of the film against the film bobbin, and accordingly, excluded the possibility of it being scratched with dust and dirt that could accumulate in the film bobbin. Then you had to focus the photo camera, choose the shutter speed, gently press the shutter release, and as a result, a frame was formed on the film. After the film was completely used, it was removed from the camera, and you had to develop it. 
The development process. The whole process assumed. Filling a tank with clean water and placing the film in it and swelling of the emulsion. Draining the water, pouring a developer, developing, draining the developer, rinsing the film from the developer, pouring a fixer, fixation of the image, rinsing after fixing, drying, and after that the film was ready for further printing with some reservations. The developer could be bought in a store, but you could make it yourself, because there were many recipes for developers, and the result of film development by different developers was different. Therefore, depending on what conditions and what you were shooting, on a sunny day in nature, on a cloudy day in nature, indoors with artificial lighting, indoors with a flash, you had to choose a developer that would provide the best quality of the negative. Therefore, the developer was made by people themselves. Per liter of water, the accuracy of ingredients, plus or minus 5 milligrams on a pharmacy scale. Next, the development process. The time with an accuracy of plus or minus 15 seconds from the development time, which had to be indicated on the film packaging or prescribed for a specific developer formula. And the development temperature, plus or minus half a degree. The same was for water and the fixer. Then the film dried and it was necessary to carefully remove the frozen drops from it, because if they were not removed, they would be in the photo. Then we came to the stage of printing. The first was to prepare an enlarger. The enlarger had an incandescent lamp. Every incandescent lamp had its own unique characteristics. Therefore, adjusting the enlarger was, first of all, ensuring equal illumination over the entire field onto which the image would be projected. Then the negative was put into the enlarger and you needed to choose the shutter speed and photographic paper. It was also of different types, with a different degree of contrast of the image when printed from the same negative, which would correspond to the negative. After that, the imprint was developed. The imprint was washed. The fixation was also in the bath with the fixer, rinsing from the fixer, drying, glossing, and in the end we had a photo. So, if this entire technological process is violated, then the quality will be lost somewhere. The photo will be technically imperfect. Well, as a maximum, Pitya cannot be distinguished from Katya. But at a minimum, dust, prints of hairs that got into the optical path of the camera or enlarger, errors with the shutter speed, yellow spots as a result of poor washing of photographic paper, and so on and so forth. But if you follow the entire technological process, then the photo will be technically flawless, and only the question of its artistic merit will arise. Technical perfection assumes that all details, both in light and in shadows, are visible, that the grain is small, that is, many, many pixels, if we draw analogies with digital photography, uniform illumination throughout the field of the photo, and the photo does not turn yellow. Decades later, it looks the same, as if it had just been printed. Therefore, the question of technological discipline is the most fundamental question in the matter of quality assurance, on condition that the production process is built on the basis of those technologies and that organization that allows to ensure this quality. But technology and construction of production, they are very connected, mutually conditioned by each other. Here is a picture of a Soviet long-range PE-8 bomber. The PE-8 was developed at the end of the 1930s and was mass-produced from 1940 to 1944. And this is the American bomber B-17 Flying Fortress. It was developed at the same time, and, as you can see, they are even very similar in appearance. But, in particular, both of them on the fuselage have a pilot's cockpit superstructure, although each of them has a certain peculiarity. Before talking about them further, I turn to the documents of that era. 1931 the first all-union conference of socialist industry workers. Speaking there, Stalin said, we are 50 or 100 years behind the advanced countries. 
we must make up this gap in 10 years. Either we do it, or they will crush us. This was said in 1931, 10 years before the start of the Great Patriotic War. Now let's get down to the small details. Yes, indeed, the PE-8 is close to the Flying Fortress in terms of its flight and tactical qualities. On the PE-8, VM Molotov made a foreign trip. Having flown over the occupied territory of the Soviet Union, the PE-8 flew to England and then from England to the United States with a landing in Canada. We were not ashamed to show the PE-8 both in England and in the USA. But we must understand that in the Russian Empire, the aircraft industry was very bad. In particular, although the Ilya Muromets was built and mass-produced, the Ilya Muromets engines were not Russian Imperial-made engines. First these were German engines, and then, when the First World War began, these were French engines. The Russian Empire began its own production, according to licenses, only during the First World War. And, on the basis of this, Klimov's company took shape in the following production. Aircraft engines for most helicopters. During the war, aircraft engines for YAK fighters and PE-2 bombers. But you must understand that the creation of an aircraft like the PE-8 is the realization of a scientific implementational cycle, from fundamental work in the field of fundamental science to research and development in the field of material science, aircraft design, and aircraft engine design. There was a publication in which it was reported that as of 1941, there were fewer aviation engineers in the Soviet Union than working at one Messerschmitt company. Therefore, the appearance of the PE-8 should be viewed in fact as an economic, scientific technological miracle that was performed at that time. Moreover, if we talk about that time, the Moscow Aviation Institute, MAI, arose in 1930. The Leningrad Shipbuilding Institute emerged as an independent higher educational institution in 1930. And many of the country's higher educational institutions, leading for their industries, were created precisely in the late 20s, after 1925 or in the early 30s, that is, in 1930, 1932. Next, let us count. The formation of a scientific school, the formation of an engineering, research and development school, takes 10 to 15 years, depending on the field of activity in which the scientific technological school operates. 1930, the creation of the MAI. 1935, the first graduates of the MAI received diplomas, came to work. Plus 10 years, 1945. This was the time the first graduates of the Moscow Aviation Institute, on condition that they could work at the limit of their intellectual capabilities, solving unbelievable for that time problems in the design of aviation technology and aircraft equipment. Only by 1945 would they reach a level where one could say, yes, the research and development schools have become full-fledged. Therefore, the fact that the PE-8 appeared, this was a miracle, as it is a miracle that by 1941, T-34 tanks had appeared, new principled weapons had appeared, ZIS-3, independent development of Vasily Gavrilovich Karabin, Yakovlev, Petyakov, Ilyushin, Tupolev, Lavochkin aircraft had appeared. Now let's get down to the details. In this photo, there is a stamp, TSAGI secret. The photo was taken from the internet. The process of forming the first copy of the TB-7 ANT-42 bomber is underway. In fact, this is the lead aircraft of the PE-8. TB-7 became PE-8 after the death of Petlyakov in 1942 in honor of Petlyakov's merits in the creation of this aircraft. Here is the same TB-7, but from a different angle. Look, this is the left wing in the area of the future console of the fourth engine, the last engine of the starboard side. A worker is lying on the wing. Another worker is standing behind the wing, 
You can see him, but his image is blurry, because apparently there was not enough lighting and a long shutter speed when shooting. And another worker, his image is also blurry, is kneeling on the wing console, and some tools are in front of him. Here you can see that the scaffolding around the plane is just hammered up from improvised boards. Here you can see especially clearly that the scaffolding is made on location, with poor quality, and so on. Look, this is a B-17. Moreover, this aircraft, apparently, is of a pre-production or first series, because it's clear that the engine nacelles are sleeked down and, in fact, aerodynamically form a single hole with the aircraft propellers and propeller fairings. The mass-produced aircraft already has other engines and other nacelle aerodynamics. Here you see. That is, the Americans also had certain problems that had to be solved in the transition from single pre-production copies to mass production. And here is the mass production of the B-17. Many nose sections of the fuselage, workers work on each section, everything is done in a workshop with a very high energy supply capacity, the scaffolding in the workshop is not something auxiliary to the main production, but it's professionally designed technological equipment that ensures this very type of work. Here is a similar photo. Manufacturing of tail sections. War. Female labor is used. But again, the high organization of production, scaffolding, ladders, which are there, are technological equipment, but not something auxiliary. And here is an almost finished bomber in the workshop. In the background, there are fuselage nose sections of the future bombers. Well, this is a meeting of the plant about the production of the 5,000th copy of the B-17 Flying Fortress. This is another American bomber, the Liberator B-24, the most massive four-engine aircraft during the Second World War. The number of flying fortresses was around 13,000 items, somewhat less. This is more than the number of PE-2 in the Soviet Union, of which about 12,000 copies were produced. But the Liberator and Flying Fortress are strategic bombers, and the PE-2 is a frontline bomber. Here are Liberators in the production process. As you can see, in the foreground there are tail sections of the fuselage. Moreover, everything is already painted the insignia of the United States. White stars are applied, and in the background, these are no sections of the fuselage. The Liberator in the workshop at the final stages of assembly. Yes, the scaffolding is wooden. Ford did not like spending money on unnecessary things, but nonetheless, these are also scaffoldings that are made as permanent technological equipment, but not as something disposable. Well, here is the mass production of Liberators at the Ford plant. The numbers of Liberators was more than 18,000 copies and exceeded the total number of the Flying Fortresses B-17 and Super Fortress B-29, which was produced in the amount of 3,500 copies. And the apotheosis of everything is B-29. Here is a photo, apparently a staged photo, but it gives a very good idea of what went into the assembly. And each such section, an assembly module, was produced in the corresponding specialized workshops with a high level of energy supply capacity and corresponding technological equipment. So, thanks to this structure, oriented on certain modular assembly technologies, the number of bombers in the USA was very high, and they fully covered their own needs, and partly covered the needs of the Allies in the anti-Hitler coalition. This is Germany, the Third Reich, a full-scale Messerschmitt 109 in a full-scale wind tunnel. Also for comparison. Moreover, I've already said that the total number of aircraft engineers in the USSR was less than the number of engineers who worked at Messerschmitt. Therefore, the detailedness of the construction of the Germans and the Americans was much higher than ours. In aerodynamics, there is a concept called resistance of loss of impulse. What is the essence? The plane moves in stationary air, there are some cracks, there are cavities inside. Through these cracks the stationary air gets into the plane. The plane moves at a speed of several hundred kilometers per hour, and accordingly, 
In order to accelerate the stationary air to the speed of the plane, you need to spend some energy. Further, this air flows out of the cavities of the aircraft through some other slots. Therefore, part of the engine's power is constantly spent on propelling the stationary air flowing inside the aircraft. Further, all kinds of leaky hatches, including the cockpit canopy, hatches through which the engine and other aircraft equipment is serviced. The Germans had all such hatches, as a rule, on elastic bands, and due to this, the resistance of loss of impulse was reduced. On most of our aircraft, for a long time, many of these types of hatches fit into the contours of the aircraft, but were not sealed. Therefore, the resistance of loss of impulse affected the flight speed, including the maximum one. But you yourselves understand that if, for example, our planes are built like this, and when any small detail comes, first of all, the perimeter is limited, the flow rate of parts will therefore be limited through the limited perimeter. The total perimeter of all modules, with the orientation of technology towards modular assembly, is much higher than with such an assembly. And accordingly, work can be performed faster by distribution into modules. And then, ready-to-assemble modules are delivered to the assembly site, and the aircraft takes shape. After connecting everything together, there remains only to lay some cables that should be continuous, and should not have connections. Lay some pipes, well, and mount the connections where they are allowed on any internal equipment. But this character of the assembly also programs certain errors. And if you look at the reports of the People's Commissariat for Internal Affairs, on products in the aviation industry in the 1930s, you will see that during the flaw detection of the aircraft, in its various cavities, they found things such as, first of all, chisels, hammers that the workers had left, and among other things, files. The presence of files indicates a low level of technological preparation, due to which some parts had to be fit in place. Here, such things are excluded by the very organization of the technological process. And here, they are programmed. And then we turn to sad statistics. 93 items were built, including the PE-8. Of these, 55 aircraft were lost. Of the lost, 28 were lost as a result of accidents and disasters. Of these, five were lost during forced landings, some of which could have been caused by combat damage. The Germans destroyed 23 aircraft. In addition to these 23 planes, four planes were lost as a result of shelling by our fighters and air defense, and as a result of errors in governance towards the troops. One of the new aircraft crashed at the airfield of the Kazan aircraft plant as a result of the fact but the mechanics forgot to remove the clamps from the elevators, and the plane bumped into a railway embankment during takeoff. Of the aircraft taken down by the enemy, at least four aircraft were lost by reason of the fact that in the night sky they were unmasked by the exhaust fire from the M82 engines. You can watch the exhaust from the engines on YouTube, find videos related to the Lockheed Super Constellation passenger airliner. There are several videos showing the plane during startup and takeoff. So the exhaust from the engines is about one meter long. The question is open as to what reasons exhaust suppressors were not installed on the PE-8 together with the M82 engines, because the fact is, this statistics, 28 aircraft, more than half of the production was lost due to accidents and disasters. And you know, PE-8 was flown by former polar aviation pilots, former pilots of bombers. There were no beginners there. Someone only after graduating from the aviation school, having done the takeoff landing program, they were really exceptionally experienced pilots, exceptionally experienced flight mechanics. They were, in fact, the elite of the Air Force of the USSR. The PE-8 itself was not a mass-produced aircraft like the IL-2, 35,000 copies if I'm not mistaken. The PE-2, 12,000 copies, which were produced at large-scale production plants. The PE-8 was actually handwork, from the first copies to the last. 
And the fact that 28 planes were lost as a result of accidents and disasters is an indicator that the quality of the production left much to be desired. In addition, the PE-8 is also a victim of insufficient practice of applied science in the USSR, because you yourselves understand that when designing an airplane, a lot is done in order to increase its efficiency, reduce load weight, and for this, the structures of the aircraft themselves must be extremely light, and in order to make it extremely lightweight, chrome and silk steel was used in the structure of the PE-8 aircraft. The chromatsil steel had the ability to withstand quite high static loads, and it was embodied into the structure of the aircraft, in particular the spars, the main structural member of the PE-8 wings, were made of this steel. But it turned out that under the impact of cyclic loads, microcracks appeared in the chromatsil steel. The microcracks spread, what is called metal fatigue occurred, the bearing capacity of the metal weakened, and the structures collapsed. In the Soviet Union, the problem of metal fatigue was first encountered on the PE-8, and for this reason, almost all aircraft were delivered for revision, strengthening the structure against fatigue. The same problem was encountered on the LA-7. The LA-7 aircraft also had this steel in their structure, and they broke when the stress intensity factor of the crack exceeded the fracture toughness of the material. But in fact, in 1944, the operation of the PE-8 was almost completely stopped. On the one hand, the situation on the fronts had changed, and other bombers could reach the facilities in Germany. But on the other hand, it was this unsolved problem of fatigue that did not allow the aircraft to be operated safely. Therefore, in 1944, the PE-8 had practically ceased to fly. Well, one of the last catastrophes happened after the war. On September the 12th, 1945, after takeoff, the wing of the PE-8 fell off. That plane was supposed to be the leading aircraft in the victory parade on June the 24th, 1945. Then the air section of the parade was cancelled due to weather conditions. Well, imagine what a nightmare it would have been if the plane had fallen apart over the Red Square and crashed in Moscow. But God did not let it happen. But the problem of product quality was in all types of military equipment. A quite big number of tanks, KV, T-34, in 1941 were lost due to failure, due to poor production quality, and some errors in the structure. The same goes for airplanes. The case of the military representatives, the minister of the aviation industry and the commander of the USSR Air Force, was opened not from scratch, it was not a fabricated case. Petlyakov died on an airplane of his own design, the PE-2, during a flight from Kazan to Moscow. The cause? Poor quality of production, production defectiveness, as a result of which one of the engines caught fire in the air. For the same reasons, long-range bombers YER-2 were easily flammable. After the war, the country switched to a peaceful life and Ilyushin made the first copy of the IL-18 plane. The IL-18 was shown for the first time at the air parade on August the 3rd, 1947. Then, a few days later, Stalin had a conversation with Ilyushin. Stalin asked, How many passengers does your new plane carry? 75, Comrade Stalin, answered Ilyushin. Comrade Ilyushin, do you know that any catastrophe is a tragedy for the state? I do not recommend that you continue to work on this aircraft. And further in the quoted source, the following phrase is given. This was how the project of a long-range capacious aircraft, which could connect the remote cities of Siberia and the Far East region with the European part of the USSR, was postponed for more than 10 years. Stalin appears here as a petty tyrant. Well, now let's recall the non-combat losses of the PE-8 and other aircraft during the Great Patriotic War. If we talk about the first version of the IL-18, then it was supposed to be initially equipped with Charomsky diesel engines. Due to the unreadiness of the Charomsky diesel engines, which began to be created even before the war, but during the war years, they could not bring them to airworthiness, 
so the plane was equipped with ASH-73 TK engines. The Russian letters TK in the engine name stand for turbocharger. The ASH-73 TK engines were developed for the Tu-4 bomber, which was a clone of the American B-29 Superfortress. The ASH-73 TK engine was based on the American Wright Cyclone 18 engine. But then it turns out that the resource of the ASH-73 TK was only 25 hours, and that of the B-29 engines, 500 hours. And failures of the ASH-73 TK engines were so frequent that once the question of replacing them on the Tu-4 bomber for other engines was considered. In addition, due to the fact that the high-altitude engines were not created at that time, the TB-7 lost in altitude, but won in range, since the weight was compensated for by the fuel reserves. Well, as it lost in altitude, this made it an object for attack by fighters, because initially the TB-7, when the pressurization unit was operating, rose to the height at which the fighters of the era could barely stay in the air. Well, in addition to this, in most cases, it even had the advantage of speed, at heights of about 10 kilometers. But anyway, this lecture was not devoted to questions of aviation during the Great Patriotic War, but to the fact that construction and technology are closely linked. And this link between construction and technology conditions the quality of products. Therefore, designing a construction without knowing the technologies on the basis of which it will be produced is a stupid task. But any progress in the field of design requires corresponding progress in the field of technological support. Once again, it is necessary to build a technological process and follow technological discipline, then on condition that the set of requirements was formulated correctly and correctly implemented in the construction, the quality of the product will also be ensured. That's all for today.